Welcome to Picks with the Professor, the show where a real statistics professor gives you sports betting tips. This is Monday, April 8th, Major League Baseball. First off, this is Eclipse Day, so if you're watching this during the eclipse, go outside and check that out. It's a once-in-a-lifetime type thing, depending on where you live. Uh, probably. I, I actually looked at where the other eclipses were going to be, and there's going to be one at some point down in the future, but it's going to be like really far south, like maybe if you live in Florida, like South Texas, you know, but but you may not get another opportunity. So, so check out the eclipse if, you, if, if it's still coming, you know, it's supposed to be pretty cool, but otherwise we will have some baseball night. In fact, I think the Yankees were supposed to play a day game and moved it to, to the night. So uh, already affecting uh, baseball here, but uh, we will have a full, almost a full slate here. 13 games on a Monday. A lot of Mondays later on in the season we get weaker, uh, but plenty of games here for us. Folks, if you're not with us in another club yet, check that out. We have a Discord chat over there. We have a lot of fun, a lot of great advice. Uh, that's where I can answer questions easily. Uh, first five picks, one line picks, reverse run line picks, what to do with boosts, all sorts of good information over there. Uh, summaries, uh, more information, all sorts of benefits. Over there, and of course, picks when you can't watch the show or picks for when we don't have a show. That would be the case Sunday. We had a terrible Saturday, unfortunately. Uh, but I think Sunday here, I think, has gone pretty well for us. Obviously, we, you know, I'm not going to win every pick, but Sunday seemed to go pretty well here. And so uh, if you're with us on Dub Club, you were with us for that. So a 10 day free trial start. Yeah, that QR code there or the link in the show description will get you set up uh, with us over there on Dub Club. Maybe turning around some of our luck. We seem to just not really be able to buy many breaks. And that looked like it was going to continue early on Tuesday uh, for us. But uh, get that Giants win. Maybe that maybe it's going to turn us around a little bit. You know, the, the, the luck stuff just it comes and goes. We always talk about the variance. We'll have stretches of good variance. We'll have stretches of bad variance. You know, we've kind of had a little bit of a, of a stretch of bad variance here. And really our goal is just to kind of like tread water in the bad variance. Because when the good variance hits, that's when we'll take off. And that's kind of how it's been historically. If you've been around here for any time, you know, we're, we're for the most part, um, especially if I just look at like the plays of the day, it's like you have a month where it's just crushing it and people are just making money left, right? The next month is just kind of break even. We're just kind of hanging around, just kind of hold those wins. But you never know when it's going to take off and when you're just trying to hold your own, when it'll turn around, maybe get that Giants one. I'll turn us around here. The Astros tonight, maybe that'll turn us around. A great pick on them as they're still holding on. Right, I had to, had to go throw back Astros here to kind of get our luck going in the right direction. So maybe that'll work. Obviously, it won't do anything for us, but it, it makes me feel better, you know. So uh, check out Dub Club if you haven't um, yet. Some reminders, of course, if you're looking for information about the model, community rules, www.pickswiththeprofessor.com slash new. Reminder, we're projecting an average game. Folks, one game, weird things can happen. And, and we see that in baseball all the time. A team just doesn't show up. Uh, you know, one team just destroys the other team, uh, whatever it may be, right? And so we're predicting an average game. We have no idea what will happen in one game. And that's why we're so concerned about the price. We're hoping that we have a well calibrated model. Sideline has proven to be that over the last several many years. And that when we say 55%, we really do mean 11 out of 20. It's going to lose nine out of 10 times. But that's okay because we're just looking for that little two, three, four percent edge that we can get. And in the long run, that's going to make us money. And that's all that we're about here. Anything is a good bet at the right price or number. And anything can be a bad bet at the right price or number. The difference between sharp and square is not the side, it's the number. As a reminder, of course, there's no locks in gambling. Take what you like and leave the rest. But we really like it when you like it. If you hit that like button on that show, it helps us. It helps other people find us. helps keep us afloat, which is always good. New feature, fun feature that we're going to start adding. We're going to do the parlay of the day. I'm going to keep it simpler. Y'all know if you've been here for a while, I'm not a big parlay guy. And I long have talked about the reasons why. The parlays in and of themselves are not necessarily a problem. It's how people abuse them is the problem. You know, if you're if you're putting the same team in multiple parlays, you have a bunch of eggs in one basket. So it's like a big no-no, right? Um, the other issue with parlays is just making sure your money, you, you have the right amount of risk on each team and, and, and that kind of gets crazy. And then sometimes just the decision of how you're pairing with what, there's all sorts of complications with parlays. And of course, the big one is people think putting a bad play to parlay makes it a good play. That's not the case, right? So I'm not going to be going for home run parlays, but I'm going to be thinking about two team parlays for the most part, making those official things that will drop throughout the show. I've done it twice already this season on show. Uh, uh, both of those have won, uh, and I did it Sunday on um, Discord, and that one won as well. So I figured, hey, clearly this is the right idea, and I've been talking and thinking this through, and that's what I've kind of been saying here all along, you know, that if, if you're doing those short ones with the right teams, the right situation, you know, it can be pretty advantageous to do that. So we're going to try that. That's something to look forward to. 
Uh, but what's something nice to look forward to is White Sox baseball. They're going to get us kicked off here at 5 10 p.m. Eastern against the Guardians. It's projected to be a bullpen game right now, so there is no line on this game. And thus, there is no official pick as of yet. We'll figure out who's starting at some point tomorrow. And so we'll have an official updated pick. Send that to everybody on Dub Club uh, when we can get that information. But a bullpen game for the White Sox does not project to go well because their bullpen isn't very good. Their offense isn't very good. The Guardians are just very okay. Uh, offensively, uh, they will be starting Tristan McKenzie, who's very okay. I, I'm a little bit higher on him than what happened in that first start, but that first start, he got shellacked. Uh, and the underlying metrics weren't great for that first start either. So overall, just kind of a ho-hum uh, starter there. Again, uh, uh, you know, my, my excitement for him tempered a little bit on that first start. We'll see if he can bounce back here. If you're going to bounce back, this is the time to bounce back, right? Of course, the Guardians' bullpen is, of course, their strength. Um, and, and will have to be, especially now with, uh, without Shane Bieber. Well, also, they went three out of four times. They should be big favorites. I'm assuming they will be big favorites. The way I've been treating the White Sox is if I'm going to play them, it's going to be only first five and really only when Crochet pitches. I mentioned that on Sunday. I was a little bit hesitant to pull the trigger because the price wasn't great. There was like C-grade value on it, I believe, and that one. Wasn't going to touch a full game, though. And that's kind of how I feel here. It's Guardians or pass. If the price is right, let's play the Guardians. If it's not, we pass. Uh, I don't want to back the White Sox. I doubt the value is actually there uh, on them. And so it's, like I said, it's Guardian. Guardians are pass, but we'll see what happens in the morning. 6.05 p.m. The Marlins finally get us a win. Get, get them a win. Uh, so congrats to them for becoming the last team to finally do so. They'll play the Yankees here. Uh, and a pair of lefties, Jesus Lazardo and Nestor Cortez. We're getting around to the third time through for some of these starting pitchers, uh, aside from the ones who, uh, of course, got to pitch in Korea. Neither one of these guys has looked great this season. Lazardo, of course, as I mentioned before, had, some, had a little bit of Cy Young hype coming into the year. Not been amazing so far. His ex-fip at least is encouraging, but again, we're not going to make too much of it. We're just going to say, eh, you know, Cortez hasn't looked great. His underlying has kind of been mad. We're really mostly still going off of last year's data, the year before's data, the projection based off their age, et cetera, um, at this point. And so we're still thinking Lazardo's a good pitcher. We're still thinking Cortez is okay. But obviously you have to be concerned about both these guys. If you have them on, both your, on your fantasy team, right? You have to be a little bit concerned. You haven't been too pleased with the results. Uh, but the Marlins will have the edge starting pitcher Bullpen wise, the models dropped their bullpen to below average, but I mean, their bullpen has been just dreadful this season. Uh, the Yankees, of course, have the much better offense, and that's why they are favored because even though Lazardo is the better pitcher, the offense the difference is a lot. Right now, uh, there's not a lot of value to be found. It would be double C grade pick right now on the under or the Marlins. Uh, this falls into a classic situation, as I've kind of mentioned, uh, where there's rarely value on the Yankees. So when there is, we like to jump. We did that on Sunday uh, with an A grade play and love that. Didn't work for us on uh, whatever the day was, Saturday, Friday, whenever that was. Um, but, it, you know, it did on Sunday. And so that's the, the, the it was Friday. I guess it was. Um, and that's the thing is that it's going to work out more times for us for not when there is value on them. A lot of times, though, it's like this. There's not going to be really any value. If you're going to back the Marlins, you like doing it with the Alec Lazardo. I'm not really sure I can do it, though. So I would need much better value than what there is now. Maybe we'll have a pick on the side tomorrow. Maybe we won't. The total is more so where I'd be focused. But right now the model is projecting 7.9 runs. So under eight is not the worst thing in the world, but it's not that exciting either. So if I had to make a pick on this, I probably would go under and say, I think these lefties are probably a little bit better than the numbers indicate, but uh, it's not the most exciting number to go under. So as of right now, no pick on it. We'll see what happens in the morning. Got some picks though here coming up for you on the remainder of the games. I think there's only one other game uh, the rest of the show that we will not have a pick on. So we'll start off here hot and heavy with a Brewers A grade play. Had the Brewers as an A grade play on uh, basically all weekend, it seems like. And it, it, it worked out well for us here, especially on Sunday. Um, I believe uh, I believe they won two out of three. And so uh, that's, you know, exactly what we're hoping for in the A grades. As long as we're not playing, you know, minus 250s from the Brewers were not priced at that point. So uh, we'll go back to the well here with the Brewers. I mentioned this before. I'm just not a big believer in the Reds. And we saw it with how they played against the Mets, who nobody believed in. And the Mets took two out of three and really should have won the third one. Uh, if if my memory is correct, they really uh, botched the game uh, on Saturday where they had the lead and then the bullpen just completely um, blew things up. And that was, of course, um, you know, Something the Mets sometimes do, but I mean, they, they just about swept the Reds uh, in Cincinnati. And this is my point. This Reds team just, 
I don't think they're bad. I just don't think they're quite as good as the hype. And so I don't think the market's adjusted. And so we're going to probably continue to fade the Reds here, at least for most of the month of April. <clears throat> Pitching wise, Aaron Ashby and Graham Ashcraft. Note that this is Aaron Ashby's first major league appearance in quite some time. Uh, the model is dinging him for that. It is, we have factored in a decreased expected number of innings and a decreased efficiency because of that. And we still have this at Brewers 56% to win. That makes Brewers minus 101 in a great play. So the idea here is I don't really trust either one of these offenses, but even though Ashby gets that ding, I still got him as a better pitcher than Graham Ashcraft, despite a very good start for Ashcraft this first time around. I still like the Brewers bullpen a lot better. And so this is not a coin toss game, even though it's price is one. We think the Brewers should be slight favorites in this one. And so anytime you've got 55% or higher at anything or even money, that is a great scenario to find ourselves in. And again, like I said, in general, I'm very happy to fade the Reds here early on in the season uh, until the market kind of realizes that the team is decent, but not great. So a great play on the Brewers is our first official pick here of this show. Also at 7.40 p.m. Eastern, Tigers and the Pirates. Uh, we're going to uh, go under on this one. And this one was a game, I think you can look a couple different directions. But the biggest question you have to ask yourself here, and Cousin Drew and I talked about it, is what's up with Mitch Keller? And we talked about last year, the kind of struggles at the very end of the season after having such a great year and a half or whatever it was run uh, on him, the de the decrease in his velocity in spring training, the struggles here early in the season. Here's the thing. His underlying metrics are more positive than his ERA, which is good. The concern, the underlying metrics are not anywhere near as good as the numbers he put up in the last year and a half. And that's why the model has him at a 94, because if these underlying metrics continue to be what they are, uh, right now, he'll be in that average to slightly better than average category, which is where he is now, which is not as good as he was at his peak, uh, middle last year, early last year, whatever year before, I can't remember exactly when he peaked, but I mean, he had a good little run. I don't think the ERA, I, I'm not overly concerned about that. I think he's okay. If he can't get his velocity back, I don't think he'll ever reach that same form he was, but that doesn't mean he still can't be respectable. That's exactly what we think about Reese Olsen. He's been a guy, as a young guy I've been high on, and then I've said, hey, a lot of these young guys, they come up and I'm like, yeah, I don't I don't trust this guy. Like, He's probably going to get shot, especially on the team with as many losses as the Tigers. But he's been a guy, if you've been with us last year, you know I talked about liking this guy. He threw five and two-thirds shutout uh, last time out. And the metrics weren't great, though, but he's still a solid pitcher and the same sort of thing. Like, I'm not sure at this point he's great. I'm not sure he, he can get there. Uh, maybe, maybe not, but right now he's very solid. I think these two pitchers are pretty even. I think you've got a lot of uncertainty with Olsen still being a young guy, some ups and downs with that. Mitch Keller, obviously you have some concerns about. I think either pitcher could outdo the other one in this game, and it wouldn't be the most surprising thing uh, in the world. That's what the model is saying, that they're um, pretty uh, pretty even. Pirates are the better offense. Pirates are their bullpen. Pirates are at home. Pirates are favored. Pirates should be favored. You can look pirates or under on this game is the way I'd be looking at it. I'm 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 a little bit. I said all that about Mitch Keller. I'm a, I'm still a little bit nervous about him. Um, and so rather than play the pirates, who I don't think are a bad play, I just am looking at the juice we'd have to lay. I'd rather go under because you're kind of eyeing the same sort of um, similar edge, similar value, small value, um, but we're laying less odds. And so that's to me the upside, because either way, we're hoping Mitch Keller does well. If Mitch Keller does well, the under is going to be great, because... Olsen's not a bad pitcher. The Tigers relievers are decent. They're going to play in low scoring games. It's a chilly night. We're talking about mid upper 50s, slight breeze in. I mean, it's going to be pitcher friendly. As you can see that the, the minus 8% adjustment for the weather, it's April. Um, so if Keller pitches well, either one of these things I'm telling you looks good. If he doesn't, the under still got a shot, right? The Tigers could win this game like six to two. So I just think there's more ways to win with the under and just we're putting more of our eggs in the Mitch Keller basket 
with backing the Pirates. And I think with going the under, I think we're putting a few of more, we're taking a couple of like putting them on Reese Olsen, who, as I mentioned, both these pitchers are very solid. Either one can can do well. So I'd kind of going with the end, I'm kind of splitting my eggs a little bit and saying, I think one of them is going to pitch well, maybe both. Um, but I'm not putting it all on Mitch Keller, who I think will turn out to be average this year. But you, you got to be concerned about that loss of velocity. And so it's kind of a whole new world when, when something like this happens with the pitcher. So a um, couple of ways you can play this. I'm going under eight and a half C grade. Uh, other way I'm looking at the Pirates, but I think this is probably the smarter pick until I feel a little bit safer with Mitch Keller personally. If you feel safe with Mitch Keller, have at it with the Pirates. I'd rather play the under than lay the juice with them. 7 to 7 p.m. Eastern Mariners and the Blue Jays. Always a fun series here when this game's in Seattle because there's obviously a lot of people, um, you know, a lot of people north of the border there who are conflicted because they're Seattle fans because they live close to Seattle, but they're, they're Blue Jays fans because they're, uh, you know, that's that's their team, their country's team. Uh, this one, of course, be in Toronto, so so not not as many conflicting things over there <laughs> as, as much as when the game's in Seattle where it's pretty a pretty, pretty split crowd. Uh, but... Right now, we're going to back the Mariners here at uh, plus one and a half. It's a C grade pick. Um, the bottom line on this is I want to fade the Blue Jays offense any way I can. And the model says this is the best way to do it. We very rarely take one and a halves, but this Mariners team can still get stuck in the mud offensively. Their relievers, maybe not as good as they've been in years past, are still solid. Luis Castillo is a great pitcher. Um, Jose Barrios has been very solid as well. And this Blue Jays offense still continues to struggle. They had, you know, the, the one swing of the bat against the Astros was the only runs they scored there. Uh, they only got one run other than the ninth inning, other than the ninth inning against the Astros and the Yankees. They got one run in like four games. Uh, they got a few more runs on Saturday, I believe. Um, but then here on Sunday, I think they only got like two more runs or something like this. So this offense is still not that good. And I'm not sure we've really adjusted correctly as, as a marketplace. And so any way I can fade the Blue Jays offense, I'm looking to do it, whether it's the under or against them. Unfortunately, the under, we tried that on Saturday with them, but it didn't work. I'm not saying the under wouldn't work here. It's just the model thinks that the best way to attack this uh, problem of, uh, you know, how do we find the biggest, the best way to fade this Blue Jays offense is to take the run line the edge on the money line on the Mariners is smaller, and that's why we're going uh, the plus one and a half. If you want to take the money line, of course, or do the hybrid as the plus one rather than the minus one, you obviously can do that as well. Um, but the plus one and a half here, it is very steep odds, not a big risk. We're only risking 1.3 units to 1.7. Uh, so we're not risking, you know, we're not risking two units to win one. We're scaling back on that because it's a C grade. Uh, but the Mariners here is the way that I'm going to choose to fade the Blue Jays offense. It's really that simple uh, for this one. 7.20 p.m. Eastern Mets and the Braves. Julio Teron makes his return. He's been kind of hopping around different teams, it seems like, uh, as of late. And now he's, uh, last several years now, he's with, with the Mets against Charlie Morton, who seems to continue to defy father time. Uh, a pretty solid first start to the season uh, for Morton. This will be Tehran's first outing in the bigs this year. We're going to go under nine and a half. It's B grade. Um, the Braves finally played the under game that I was expecting of them on Sunday as the game Saturday had way more runs than was expected despite the uh, favorable pitching conditions. Uh, I believe we had the Braves minus one as an A-grade pick Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I think we pushed, pushed, and won. So we, we did well, at least with the side on that one. Uh, thankfully, pushing on those minus ones. I'm not going to be deterred by the fact that we picked the under on Saturday and it, you know, right blew up in our faces. Um, and, and what happened to Strider, right, which uh, it turns out was partially a Dimebacks jumping on a partially a loss of velocity, which is where he's, you know, having the UCL issues. Uh, and Max Freed, I mean, I, I don't know what in the world. Uh, two terrible starts. The, the first one, again, as I, as I mentioned, right? Middle of the zone, strike three called. He's out of the first inning. But it still wasn't a great first inning. But, but could he have done better in that first game? I don't really know. In the second game, just, I don't know. I don't know what's going on with him. If you're a brace and you have to be really concerned about your top two pitchers, of course, um, I'm not going to be deterred by any of that. We saw the under game on Sunday, which the playbook here is the same playbook uh, that you saw Sunday 
which is Chris Sale, Charlie Morton, two pitchers who might be a little bit past their prime, but still holding on to pretty good days, pitching well, good bullpen, score four or five runs, win five, two. I mean, that is the game plan for this Braves team every single night. I know that Friday and Saturday went weird and that's their game plan with Strider and Freed. And that's just not what happened, but that's still their game plan. Obviously they have a great offense, but they're not, you know, going to be playing. They, they shouldn't be playing those games where they score 10 runs at this time of year. When it gets to summer in that park and the ball's flying, or when they're playing at Cincinnati and the ball's flying, they're playing at St. Louis in the summer, it's 100 degrees, right? Sure, they're going to score 10 runs in those games because their offense is that good. But we're still talking low 60s and a 5 to 10 mile an hour wind blowing in, mid 60s start, you know, wind blowing in. This park and these conditions plays very difficult to score runs, and it can happen. You saw it Friday and Saturday, uh, but again, you saw it on Sunday it can still play out just like we think. And I'm just going to say whatever the heck's going on with Strider and Freed was the problem there. Otherwise, I think we're on the right track. You saw the Mets as well, kind of this week against the Reds, that one inning aside where things blew up. Friday game, easy under. Sunday game, easy under. Some of those Tigers games, easy under, except for the one that went to extra innings, uh, which only was there because the zombie runners, right? So this Mets team setting up to be kind of similar, right, with not a great offense. Obviously, the Braves have the edge here in starting pitching. And the biggest concern for this under is do the Braves does, – does Julio Tehran record a single out against the Braves, right? That's the big concern is that you have to – you don't know what you're going to get from Tehran at this point. Anytime a guy is of this age and has been this questionable for the last several years, every time a new year happens, it's like, does he still got it, right? That's the concern. Nine and a half, though, offers us a lot of value. And so I think under nine and a half makes a lot of sense. I would not be going under eight and a half. Under nine, the model would tell us to do it. I love having the win on nine, though. And that's where this pick, I think, makes some sense for us. 7.40 p.m. Eastern, Dodgers and the Twins. This is our other game with no pick as of yet. Um, not a lot of value in either direction. And I want to think through this one a little bit more. I, I made these picks like before we even... I think resumed the Dodgers Cubs game. Like I want to see how like how long that delay was going uh, because I I think that's a concern, right? We've seen it before that the Sunday night game with the travel sometimes makes things difficult, but they've tended to try to mitigate that. One of the ways they're mitigating it here for the Ashes Rangers is that they're playing another game on Monday. A side note: I don't know why it's not an afternoon game. Why does ESPN not have a Monday afternoon baseball package? We'd all love to be distracted from the day we'd all watch it you always make it the sunday night game the sunday night game is always big you always do a replay monday afternoon they can travel and do. anyway um you know they've tried to mitigate it by doing a lot of like you know dodgers giants or dodgers padres type thing where like one team plays one and they go to the other one so it's like really short travel but then when you have these really long delays on sunday it throws things off because that wasn't the travel you were expecting that might be more of an issue for the Cubs, which we'll talk about later, because the Dodgers here going from Chicago to Minnesota, that's not a really long flight. So it's probably okay, but that is just something that throws everything off a little bit. And the Twins are in a really advantageous position by not playing on Sunday, knowing they aren't going to play on Sunday, very rested at this point. So this game's going to, this is a little weird. It's a little bit weird. So, so just take that in, into consideration. The model, I, 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 Put that the rest factor in, the travel factor in. I've, we've got that accounted for here. And I've got the, the Dodgers' is favored, but only 55%. Right now, there's not a lot of value on either side. So I'm just going to hold off. Let's let's see what options are available to us in the morning. But um, James Paxton and Bailey Ober, a pair of very respectable pitchers. It's hard to want to fade either one of these guys because, uh, you know, Paxton, obviously a great story, and and you know what he can do. Bailey Ober, while he got <laughs> absolutely destroyed in his first start, we know is a more, is a better pitcher than that. Um, just kind of like right in the middle, and where it's like, hey, the Dodgers' offense, if they aren't fatigued from this weird travel situation, like they ought to put up some runs. But then you consider the temperature of this game below forties. You know, <sighs> that's just a lot. Thing, a lot of things happening. The Twins' offense can really disappear for a while. Um, you know, maybe you can on packs and hold them down. You maybe under the smart play, but as of right now, uh, the model is has a lot of value on it. So right now, I, I just think it's better to pass right now. We'll see what happens in the morning. Of course, there's an official pick, but don't fear because I got you covered for an official pick on every other game. 
the rest of the slate, including Phillies and the Cardinals here. We're going to go Phillies, A grade play at plus 109. Sideline gives them a 54% chance to win our favorite type of game, the WTF game, wrong team favored. Spencer Turnbull, very respectable pitcher, had a fantastic first start for the Phillies, and the underlying metrics were incredibly impressive as well. So it wasn't a fluke. Again, that isn't necessarily – underlying metrics for one game is not necessarily predictive. But, again, it wasn't a fluke. It was a great start. Everything lines up for him to be a respectable pitcher versus Miles Michaelis, who in his two starts – Hasn't looked great. I'm not sure it's quite as bad as Eddie R.A., but Michael M- Michaelis has been a pitcher at this point that's kind of profiled as average to below average for the last couple of years now, past his prime. And so the Phillies have the better starting pitcher. Um, Bullpen-wise, it's probably a wash. We'll give the Cardinals an edge there. That's definitely the strength of this team. Um, but the Phillies' bullpen is not bad at all. And, of course, the Phillies have an edge at, at offense. And so that's all enough to add up to the Phillies should be slight favorites. The fact they're slight dogs makes Phillies plus 109 a very strong play. 8-5P Masters and the Rangers. Again, the uh, one carryover game to help them out for the Sunday night travel situation. Um, and they'll be tired for Tuesday, but whatever. Um, from Rafael Dez and Andrew Heaney, a pair of lefties. We're going to go Astros here at minus 133. It's a C-grade pick. Um, from Rafael Dez, I was high on him. That first start was really concerning. Second start, he looked great. We're going to back him here. T- uh, uh, timidly is the thing because the model is still very high on him. And I'm trying to look at the model, help the model help you know guide us. And what the model is telling us with his 74 grade rating is I still believe in him. I still like what I'm seeing under the hood. We shouldn't be as concerned. As an Astros fan, knowing this team, knowing the struggles he had at the end of last year, I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just, like I said last week, I was like, I need to see him kind of prove it a little bit. He did in that one start. It was just one start. This is a big one for him. He's been a guy who sometimes in the big moments, um, I don't want to say crumbled under pressure, but he gets a little bit too excited, a little bit whatever it may be. This is one of the benefits of having Carlos Correa. There were a couple of times when, when I noticed that Correa would go talk to Frumber and help calm him down. And I don't know if there's that guy on the team this year to do that. Uh, of course, Correa's been gone for a couple of years. But, uh, you know, when he was struggling last year, I don't, there wasn't really a guy to do that. You know, I don't know if that's Altuve or Pena, you know, Alvarez at first base. Someone's got to go over there and, and, you know, be able to calm him down like Correa did back when he was with the team. So we're back in the Astros because minus 133 is a good price. It's not a great price. It's a good price. Astros win this 58% of the time. They have a much better starting pitcher. Even if Framber Valdez is not Cy Young Framber Valdez, he's still a better pitcher than Andrew Heating. He had a great first start, but the Rangers have tended to be very cautious with him, pull him early, but the Astros love hitting left handed pitchers. So anytime I get the Astros against the lefty with Framber Valdez pitching, if the model says it's a decent edge, let's do it. Let's not go too heavy on them. As you can see on screen, it's basically risk a unit to risk a little over a unit to win a little under a unit. Our A grade plays, you know, we're trying to win a unit and a half, maybe more, depending on the situation. We're not going too heavy on this just a little bit as a, a little bit of a test run here, backing from her and saying, hey, can can you be trusted? Uh, models telling us to trust them. Okay, but, but we'll see. So again, not the strongest value here, but minus 133 is just too good to pass up on the Astros against a lefty. 8.40 p.m. Eastern, Diamondbacks and the Rockies. This is going to be the first leg of our parlay of the day for Monday is Diamondbacks money line. The official pick is Diamondbacks minus one. Diamondbacks minus one, if you create the minus one market uh, by betting a certain amount to win on the money line and then risking that on the run line gets you to an equivalent odds of minus 146. You should be able to find a price like that at a book that offers such a thing, or by creating it yourself, you are still laying some odds, but we are on the Diamondbacks minus one. A grade is the official pick on the parlay of the day. We're just going to play the money line, so that way we don't push. So the reason what I'm talking about on this is if you're playing this game by itself, we like the minus one a little bit better because those money line odds are pretty steep. If you push, you push. If you're playing this in the parlay, don't do the parlay at huge amount. It's just a little extra sprinkle. Okay, on the Diamondbacks here, mainly because I'm trying to fade the Rockies because they're terrible. That's the bottom line. 
<laughs> on that. Um, and you can see it on screen there. The relievers were kind of trending in the right direction, but then after the last couple of games, uh, they're this weekend going back the wrong direction. Now, this Diamondbacks team is good. Their offense is good. We've talked about it. They just had a really tough schedule to start the season, and they get their reward by getting to play the Rockies. It is on the road. The model does give the Rockies an extra home field advantage because they've historically enjoyed that. But this is a pretty big starting pitcher mismatch. Zach Gallen is one of the stronger pitchers in baseball, a guy who always outperforms his peripherals, which is impressive. Um, the model's only giving him an 80 grade, but I mean, he always tends to do better than that. So it's always a guy you love to back versus Kyle Freeland, who I made the comment at some point early in the season, he might be the worst starting pitcher to be an ace. He might be just the worst starting pitcher in baseball. I don't really get it at this point. Like he used to be respectable, but I mean, he's got a 27 ERA. He started twice, so it's not just a one-start thing. His FIP is 11, and, and and it's two starts, but I mean, it's not like we had him highly rated coming in. So he's performing worse than we expected just because that's incredible. But like a 133 grade like might be one of the might be the worst pitcher in baseball. It's definitely one of them. And that's really the bottom line is that the Diamondbacks will have a bullpen edge, but they're going to have an edge on the mound from the start. They're having an edge on offense. Rockies offense is terrible. They get some results when they play at home, when the weather's good. But otherwise, the Rockies might be the worst team in baseball. Um, you know, the White Sox are, are obviously fighting for that as well, um, but the Rockies are, are just really bad. And so we're looking to fade the, the, them as long as the model tells us there's value. At some point in the season, I don't know when it's going to be. Uh, we won't be able to. We did back the Rockies a little bit this weekend, a couple times. Um, <laughs> they, they had the opportunities, and they just couldn't get it done for us in those games. So, um, you know, we'll back the Rockies here in their home. But I'm until we get to a point where we're consistently seeing insanely ridiculous prices against the Rockies, if we can fade them, I want to. I love fading them even more when they're on the road. But even at home, with this pitching mismatch, I think people are looking at these names, Gallon and Freeland, and they're like, oh, Gallon's a better pitcher. And they don't realize just how big that gap is. I don't think they realize just how bad the Rockies bats are. This is a big mismatch. So the Diamondbacks win this three out of four times. Money line is like one of the parlay of the day. The official pick, if you're playing it by itself, is minus one A grade value. 9.30 p.m. Eastern Rays and the Angels. We're going to go over eight and a half is the free show pick here for you. B grade. Not the warmest night in Anaheim, but the model's projecting 9.1 runs. The totals haven't gone great for us this season. Mostly we've been trying to find good spots for the unders, and they've just kind of been uh, pretty variable uh, uh, for us. The overs have been a little bit stronger, so... Looking to to back and over here makes a lot of sense, especially especially when we get the win at nine and the minus one hundred five uh, makes makes just a lot of sense. This Angels bullpen can give up runs in a hurry. Um, Tyler Anderson, while he had, the results were good in his first inning, the underlying metrics were a little bit of a mixed bag, and he still projects to be a below league average pitcher. This Angels offense is solid. This Rays offense is solid. I know the Angels played a couple, you know, a whatever that turned out to be uh, Saturday night, a two, one game. And then on Sunday, you know, they didn't score anything, but you saw they gave up some runs. They can definitely do that in a hurry, but you saw on whatever it was Friday night, they scored some runs. They can score some runs too. This race team can score some runs as well. They are a very right-handed heavy team. So facing a lefty bodes well for them. And Zach Eflin, Hey, he's been a guy we talked about. We loved him, but his grades go in the wrong direction. He has not looked good in his two starts. The underlying metrics haven't been good. I don't know if any, I don't know if everything's right with him. That first start was just that one bad inning, uh, but that still counts. Uh, the second start, I didn't get a chance to watch it, so I'm not really sure. But this Angels offense is good enough. I like this over almost for the same reason that I liked the under in Pittsburgh that I talked about earlier, in that I think that one of these two teams is going to score some runs. And maybe both will. So I think there's like a really good chance this game is like six to three. Um, you know, and if both teams score runs, this game will end up with 12, 13 runs in it easily because both these teams can score. This is, um, you know, not a very pitcher friendly ballpark. Um, and the weather, this minus 5% is like one of the lowest adjustments you get this time of year for open air ballparks. So uh, I'm not really concerned about the weather getting the white. And that's where the biggest thing, and that's where we've kind of been saying some of these places are under or pass because the weather is so pitcher friendly. It doesn't mean there can't be runs, but today's 
baseball is so home run dependent that if the ball's not flying, it's harder to score runs and you're just going to like have to pair up the singles and doubles. And obviously that can happen, but um, you know, when you don't have those pitcher friendly conditions and you can add in the home runs, you just have that many more avenues to get to a number like nine, which is a fairly common outcome in baseball. So over eight and a half, B grade pick in Tampa and Anaheim. Cubs and the Padres. Again, this is the one that I'm really concerned about the travel for the Cubs. They were supposed to be on a plane. I don't even know how many hours earlier, and that's a relatively long flight. It's not obviously as long as New York to San Diego, but I mean, that's a long flight. And that rain delay was, I don't know what, like three hours, four hours. That can really put a kink in things. How is that going to manifest itself? I'm not really sure. Um, So at this point, I'm just going to say, let's play the under. We have a pitcher from the ballpark. We have the wind blowing in on a typical chilly San Diego night. And if there's any effect from this travel, from what I've noticed in the past, it tends to be that the bats really don't show up. So I don't think the Cubs are going to have an easy time scoring runs. That makes the under even more appealing than the model says. Under eight minus one twenty three is a B grade. We'd still go under minus uh, under seven and a half, but we should be out of the minus odds at that point and into at least even money. Hopefully, maybe minus one hundred five. But that's what the model's telling you the value is the B grade value. But again, the model doesn't really. It knows the travel effects give the Padres a higher likelihood of winning, but it doesn't really know exactly how to handle that. So I'm just kind of adding my own expertise in here and saying that's not to say they can't score runs. It just means I think it's a little bit less likely. So that offensive rating might take a little bit of a hit for Chicago, making it harder to score runs for them. And if that's the case, this under has even more value than the model realizes. So we're going to go under in this one. Javier Assad, six shutout innings, his first start. Underline metrics look great. Hugh Darvish, another guy who's just defying father time at this point. We continue to think he's going to struggle. And obviously he's not as good as he was in his prime, but continuing to put up really good numbers. Three very good starts so far this year. Solid underlying metrics. Two pitchers you can trust. Two offenses that can really disappear at times. We saw the Padres offense disappear with all these unders that we were getting against the Giants where they just went long stretches of time without scoring any runs. So in that ballpark, against a good pitcher, pitcher, good relief pitchers, you know, there's just a lot of ways this game goes under. So this is B grade value in the under eight, but I really like this under. I think it's a really strong investment. And then 9.45 p.m. Eastern, we're going to wrap up with the Nats and the Giants. And this is the second leg of our parlay, and it's the same thing. The minus one, minus 174 is the B-grade pick for the individual solo play. The money line is the uh, parlay of the day. And so if you are interested um, at the time of locking these picks in, the exact price uh, on that money line parlay, I believe was about plus 126 or so. Uh, and that is, again, with the Giants and the Diamondbacks. But the official picks for both of those, um, one twenty that was plus 129. The official picks on those for by themselves are the minus one. So if we're playing them solo, we're doing the minus one to get better odds. If we're doing it on the parlay, that's how we're getting the better odds. And so that's your kind of two-team parlay that makes the most sense here. Again, we also have a play of the day. That play of the day is not one of the picks given on the show. You can get that over on Dub Club. Link again in the show description. Giants, though, will be sending Blake Snell out to the hill. As I mentioned with Ashby, the model, we are accounted for that in the model. We are penalizing him, giving him a ding for his expected efficiency and his expected length of innings. And that's going to require more innings from the Giants bullpen. The benefit is they're playing the Nationals who are competing for one of the worst teams in baseball as well. Um, I don't think they're as bad as the Rockies, but their relievers are not great. Their offense better than the Rockies, you know, better than the White Sox, but it's still not great. They've got a couple decent guys, but they're still a year or two away. And they're throwing out Trevor Williams, who had a decent first start, but does not project to do well. So even though I'm not expecting Snell to go out there and throw seven innings, and if you saw Blake Snell last year, you don't expect him to throw seven innings anyway, because the guy uh, walks too many people, and that's a problem. You don't expect that to hurt you as much against the Nationals. 
because their offense isn't quite built to take advantage of that. And even if Snell is not on his game, I'm just asking him to be better than Trevor Williams. So again, low bar here to accomplish this. And so B grade value in the Giants. It's part of the money line parlay of the day because I like the Giants to get the job done here. I am a little bit concerned about Snell, but even factoring that into the model, the model still says this Nats team is not being priced as they are as bad as they are. But if you're with us in the club, you know this. We played the Nats on Sunday as a B grade plus odds winner. So we'll back the Nats if the situation is right. At home with the pitching matchup and that price of Sunday, that seemed like a game that was pretty 50 50. And we got good plus odds, and the Nats came out on top for us. This game does not set up like that. Traveling across the country, the model knows exactly where all the cities are, where you're coming from. Traveling across the country, that they got off on time, but I mean, that is a long flight from Washington, D.C. to San Francisco. They are outmatched everywhere. And even saying we get 75% of Blake Snell, the Giants still ought to win this game most of the time. The model says they win it a little over seven out of 10 times. Seven out of 10 times makes this price worth it. And the way that we want to take advantage of it is either playing the minus one or playing the money on parlay with the Dimebacks, or both, if you do both, just don't go too heavy on both because we don't want to have one game kill all of our profits from the rest of, of the night. So we like the Giants here to wrap us up. That's our show here for Monday. Again, if you haven't yet, check us out on Dub Club, that QR code with a link in the show description. We'll get you a 10-day free trial to start us out, give you a bunch of extra information, see if you like it. If you do, we would love your support to help keep this business running. Otherwise, as always, best of luck. And remember, you can eat your betting money, but please don't bet your eating money.